So I'm ready for our guest. Who is our guest? All right, let's bring her on. Uh, good afternoon. How are you doing? from backstage <laughs> <laughs> um welcome to the village uh tamir terry how are you doing i'm good how is everybody Great. excellent not um, as good as you miss terry yes welcome to the village <laughs> um so real, real real fast uh just everyone thank you for joining us right here on the village talk show uh with your host i'm roger daly um, with our co-host, John Sampson, our co-hostess, uh, Dr. Joanne Bryant. Um, just letting you know, we're, this is the village. We're dedicated to empowering the community to live a healthy, safe, and financially capable life through education. Success is not just spoken. Um, it is done. What are you doing to be successful? And you can catch us on all gamut of social media, on Instagram, on Twitter, on uh, Facebook. On, the, on on um, YouTube, and today we have our, our guest. Today is Tamia Terry. I'm proud to say uh, uh, that she's a fellow, uh, my 11 graduate. Um, All right, big up, big up, big up. Right. Joanne doesn't know what it's like to graduate from my 11. Um, to okay. me, so we get it, right. So you live through us. <laughs> right, but but she's 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 beginning to feel the love, like feel the love, like my my 11 actually graduates <laughs> a lot of good people, right? And and so forth. And Tamir, um, also proud to say she was one of my former students. And, um, you know, she's part of the conversation around financial literacy and what is it that we need to do. And what, what I love is, uh, John and, and, and Joanne, is that look at her youthfulness and to even at this age start thinking about Wealth and wealth management. So with that, with further ado, um, Tamia, go ahead, just introduce the floor, just tell us a little bit what you do and why are you here. Okay, awesome. Well, first, I want to thank you all for having me to just have a few minutes on your show just to educate, right? Like spread some information to everybody and my energy and the Meyer love and love. <laughs> a little bit about me. I actually am a financial representative and I work with World Financial Group. Not too sure if you guys ever heard of it before, but I've been on this journey growing my business there for almost two years. And prior to that, I was in school for social work. I got my degree in social work. I started to pursue my master's degree and I knew that I was put on this earth to do something big. <laughs> it wasn't just to be a social worker, but it was to impact multiple lives on a massive scale not just people in Brooklyn, not just people in New York, but to do something really massive across the entire country. And I was eventually introduced to the opportunity where I was able to kind of take my social work skills and apply it to helping families financially and giving them a little bit more peace of mind at the end of the day, giving them education that they never thought they could have learned in their lives and really just elevating our community, especially black and brown people, elevating us all so that we can change the trajectory that we've been living for so many years, right? We wanna create generational wealth and end the cycles of generational poverty. So that's a little bit about me in a quick snapshot <laughs> and what I do briefly. So, Ms. Terry, let's let 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 let's get down to it. Yes, you let's know, go. You're like, let's now get it's down to time. <laughs> you know, generational wealth. How can we create it? How can we create it by educating our people? We have. To and when it. you say educating, tell me, I'm coming to you, Ms. Terry. Educate me. <laughs> tell, tell tell me what I need to do so I can have as much money as Roderick has. Tell okay. me what I can do. What you need to do is sit down with a financial representative. No, but seriously, <laughs> um, just really taking a deep look at your finances, right? So many people, they understand that finances is important, but they don't know the exact steps to actually make that happen. So to answer your question, if somebody were to come to me and say, hey, how can I create generational wealth? Well, we have to go through your entire finances, right? See what it looks like and create some habits, create healthy habits, like, we have to make sure that your relationship with money is something that's positive and not negative. Making sure that you have a healthy relationship with money, that you're investing, you're saving, you know, you know how to spend, you know what to buy, what not to buy. Discipline, 
right? There's so many different things that you can do to make sure that you create generational wealth. And of course, I think number one at the top of the list is when you have to make really good money and you have to know how to invest it, right? Because if you don't have money to invest, then I mean, you're back at square zero. So, so, so what you're saying is, Ms. Terry, the first thing I have to look at is one, I guess, creating a budget. Your habits. You have to look at your current habits first. You see what your relationship is like to money. After I sit down with multiple people, just throughout the months, I realize that a lot of people have a damaged relationship with money, and that affects the way that they spend. Okay, do me a favor, uh, sorry. Can you? I, 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 I'm. You know, people get mad at me for that, but when you say talk about what do you mean by damaged relationship? What do you? I mean, explain to to, to our audience what you're talking about damaged relationship. And what does that look like? How do you damage a relationship with money? Because it sounds like you're in a, a love-hate relationship, like you're talking to your wife or your husband or your partner, right? So what does it mean? I mean, it could be it could be what you're talking about, but you know, what does that mean to damage relationship with money? Yeah. So when I first heard that to the term damage relationship, I was so confused because it's money. How can you have a relationship with money? But these are the things that you learn. And I would say as an example is somebody who resents money because they never had any when they were younger somebody who doesn't want to accumulate wealth i know earlier you were talking about people being selfish right people that kind of just want to make it through tomorrow because they realize that when they did have money bad things happen right like maybe they bought a lot of things and they got damaged or their family had money and they were greedy because of it or in their family there was a lot of fighting because of too much money lack of money so a lot of the time, your past experiences that will determine your relationship with money. And as a result of that, then you develop certain habits that make you interact differently with money. And that would be one example. Would you say that living paycheck by paycheck also creates a damaged relationship with money? Yes. Right. Because you're struggling. <laughs> Right. Living paycheck to paycheck, you're struggling. You don't get to see the benefits of having that extra couple hundred dollars at the end of your paycheck period. So when it comes time to get paid again and you have zero dollars in your bank account, you're upset. <laughs> you're frustrated. You don't understand why your money can't last. Right. You never had the experience to test out extra money to see what beauties it can bring in your life. And that will cause you to depend on the credit cards. Exactly. And then now we're going into debt, which is where America wants us to be. <laughs> but there's nothing wrong with debt. It depends. If you can pay it off. It depends on what well, kind of debt we're talking about, right? Because exactly. And I think that's what people need to understand, what kind of debt you are talking about. Go ahead. No, I'm just thinking that majority yes for certain people that understand finances and just understand a little bit more about money it may not be a bad thing right because you can have so many de benefits from having a little bit of debt and just paying it off right just using your credit but look at where most of americans are they're not in that position to be able to think like that so the average person that you see debt is not a good thing for them because there's ways in which you can use that debt you know and 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 Basically, it's always good to be liquid and uh, take, for example, some people may want a debt of a mortgage. Mm -hmm. You know, there's certain benefits that you can get from going in, into debt, buying a house. Mm -hmm. There's certain tax breaks you can and have an opportunity to build the equity up in a home. You know, uh, uh, so so debt, I know what you mean overall, but then you got that credit card debt, but you got other debt that can be resourceful. It's all about education, right? Because not many people know anything about that. You say debt, people think credit cards. <laughs> right. So we just have to do our part just to make sure that we're educating people full circle so that they understand absolutely everything. And I think you hit it right on the head so they can understand full circle uh, uh, about that issue. And I think a lot of people, irrespective of your... And, and I guess the main source of income for a lot of people are their salaries and a lot of them fail to take advantage of any sort of, 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 of profit sharing that the company may have uh, putting deferred comp so you're right uh, Ms. Terry it comes back to 
literacy. And a lot of people, they just want to live for today. They don't, they don't, they don't look into the future and understand when I retire, you know, that I want to be able to retire at an age where I can enjoy my life, not work until I'm 75 years old. You hit it. So it comes down to, yeah, I'm sorry, Ms. Terry. No, no, no. I was just going to tell Joanne to go ahead. <laughs> no, no. He go said, ahead. he hit it right on the um, nose. When you say that they live in the future, they don't think about the future too much. Many people are living day by day thinking of today because of maybe paycheck by paycheck situation and can't see further beyond just today. Five years from now, two years from now, 10 years. Many people during COVID didn't expect COVID to happen and hit them the way that it did, but it did. So if you were not prepared, big trouble. And that's what more than enough of us experience in regards to you're not prepared because you don't have something else saved up on. And all you're waiting on is your job. And unfortunately, a lot of companies went kaput and they couldn't work. And what do you do after that? So preparing your whole household and making sure that you are um, educating yourself on all aspects of money and financial wealth is important. Well, you know, Mr. You know, one thing that it's mind boggling to me is people that don't understand or are not financial, financially literate but they're willing to go out and pay uh, X number of dollars for brand name items, you know, to just look good and don't understand the concept of owning, being a homeowner, owning something so you can build the equity in that something and using that equity to invest. So it's the mindset of people and sometimes it's because we grew up in we grew up in a community in an era that 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 shunned um, investing or we don't educate ourselves enough about buying stocks, uh, doing certain things. So how can we uh, like how can we get rid of that 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 sort of ideology or thought process. There's something to say. No, you want something? No, go ahead, go ahead. Okay. I first I wanted to respond to Joanne and then I'm gonna move to you, John. But there you guys made so many great points in the last couple of minutes. But um to your point, Joanne, when you were talking about people that just live day to day, I was just having a conversation with somebody maybe about two days ago talking about exactly this. Um, prior to learning about financial education, you know, I was a manager at Levi's, I was in school and I was kind of just thinking about tomorrow, right? Like phone bills due next month. I have to eat this week. I have to eat next week. And because of that, I wasn't thinking about the future. It wasn't until I actually dove into kind of just learning for myself about, about financial education that I can go ahead and expand what it was that I was working on. Not only was I then thinking about, okay, I have to eat this week, but also I want to travel with my kids and not have to worry about income, right, in 20 years. Those are the, the shift that I had to have, but it started with first educating myself and at least becoming a little bit aware, right? So even before the education process, I had to be aware that there was a problem with the habits that I had, right? I had poor spending habits. So I had to be aware of that first. And I tell my clients this all the time, all the families that I sit with. The fact that you are aware is step number one. If we sit down together and you don't see a problem, then I'm not too sure that I can help you with anything because I can't really open your eyes to something that you're not willing to see. If I show you the numbers and you think that it's okay, then sure, right? At least I did my job in being able to open that up for you and give you the opportunity to see it. So I just wanted to respond that to you. And I also know you mentioned COVID and it's one of the statistics that I had written down to share with you guys. But during COVID, the pandemic, the average family had $400 in their savings account. That's I, was, not I was one of those. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, it, it's a thing, right? It's actual reality for people. And 
I don't know about you guys, but living through a pandemic with four hundred dollars that that has to be tough, right? <laughs> Just a little scary. bit, scary, right? Scary, that's scary. scary. Exactly. That's really scary. So there's a huge problem here that, of course, we want to be able to fix. So I wanted to say that in response to you, Joanne. And then in response to you, John, I know you asked, how do we go about almost changing our principles, right? The things that we value. I love this question because I was that person and I transitioned. Trust me, I was getting the new sneakers. I was getting the new handbags. I was getting my nails done every two weeks. Like I was spending money on things that didn't matter. But you know what? I had to surround myself with people that were great examples of being able to have wealth, right? I had the newest sneakers and zero dollars in my bank account, but I had to be surrounded by a group of people that bought the cheaper shoes and then invested their money, right? I had to be surrounded by that because where did I learn to buy the newest sneakers? The people that I was around, the environment that I was in my community, my friends. So it has a lot to do with changing the people that you're surrounded by. And I went through that transition period as well. And this is this was way more than just transitioning into financial education. This was a growth period for me in my life as a person, right? Like I had to transition almost from like a kid to an adult. <laughs> and one of those things were changing the people that I surrounded myself with. And as I surrounded myself with people who were making upwards of $100,000, right? And people that actually invested their money, I started to latch on. Oh, okay, you don't need those expensive sneakers. I guess I don't need them either. We're gonna go get a t-shirt from Target instead of like some other expensive store. Okay, that's cool, right? We spend our money on experiences and we invest the rest. Interesting, um, I'm, I'm, I'm having this conversation a lot with, with people, right? The, the idea of materialism and what, what that looks like, right? Um, I, I, I often say to my son, I make the following statement, my, my oldest, actually all of my kids. I said to them, it's better to be the best of the worst. No, sorry, the worst of the best than the best of the worst. Which basically is what I remind them of, like what you're saying. If I'm going to be the one making $100,000 in my group and everybody else make $20,000, I am not, there's no growth. Mm -hmm. So it seems to me like you're, 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 you're now making the same conversation, right? That, and I have friends that said, you don't need a Gucci fan, all of, not that you cannot treat yourself, but all of your stuff should not, your money has to work for you. Right. Your money has to work for you. So it's okay to once in a while treat yourself. But if you're doing it all the time, then it becomes your habit and your lifestyle. And therefore, can you, and like you say, why am I buying a $250 pair of sneakers when I could buy a pair of sneakers for $100 and invest in $150 that is a growth? Because you know what? If you buy a $150 pair of sneakers today, you see the t-shirt, now you're going to want the belt to go with the sneakers. You don't want the pants to go with the, the, the belt. You don't want the shirt or the blouse to go with the, the, the pants because they got to match, right? And you keep moving on right from there until you're stuck with no money right i love that you said that and as you were talking i was kind of thinking about okay well this goes back to the roots of what makes you happy right and again growth process from a kid to an adult not necessarily just financial growth but growth as a person you have to really think about what makes you happy I don't think it was the sneakers that made me happy. <laughs> I think it was the fact that other people were able to see them on my feet and knew that I had them that made me happy. So again, if you're changing your associations, right? Nobody in my office cares about what sneakers I have on, right? Like I could wear $10 shoes and they'll say I look beautiful, you know? So really think about what makes you happy as well because treating yourself can be as small as, I don't know, buying yourself a bottle of wine as opposed to going out and spending $300 on a day out. Right. So just really questioning, is, am I doing it for me or am I doing it for other people to see <laughs> what it is that I have? Great point that you bring up. Um, I love the fact that you mentioned who you surround yourself with will actually influence your decision, which is 100 percent right. When you notice that many of the millionaires or billionaires, they are not spending two hundred and fifty dollars on sneakers or are wearing the latest t-shirt just because it says whatever. 
um, th- that is so true. And um, that's why it's important to have different levels of friends, you know. So those that will stretch you to where you need to be, those who are on your level, and those who you're pulling up in the process. So that's important that you surround yourself with because you're teaching as, you know, those friends that are not on your level yet, you're teaching them on what to do. Those who are on your level, you guys are competing, but it's healthy competition on, okay, let's strive higher. And then the ones that's on top of you, that's higher where you're striving to be, that's, you know, you're getting um, knowledge from them on what to do. You know, increasing that way but 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 can i but can i add even what deidre's saying you know uh deidre who's an rn says that you know every two weeks she likes to treat herself uh to things that make her happy tomorrow's not promised to us so i believe that you do need to treat yourself but at the same time in the process of treating yourself you can make sure that you have that what we call uh residual income or we have that savings that we can put away for a rainy day. And it could just be meaning out of every paycheck, saving $50 or $100, just getting in the mindset of just putting money aside. And it's just like we all we all see those big water jars and we tend to put our change into those water jars to save money. Sometimes instead of putting change, we need to pay, we need to put extra dollars in those in a way to just get us into the practice of putting money aside. You know, let me just add one thing to what John is saying, and then we can move on. Because Chris also had a question. Um, uh, so I want to add, there's nothing wrong with treating yourself. The question is, are you treating yourself every day? Right. What are you cutting out? Right. So the facial is fine. The nails, you, you want to look beautiful. You want to feel good about yourself. But today is the facial. Tomorrow, the nails. Next week is the hair. Right. The following week is a new car. The next week and so forth and so forth and so forth, right? So you're always treating yourself while you're not putting away stuff. So let's be careful the difference between um, treating yourself and abusing yourself. Lastly, um, tomorrow's not promised to anyone. That's That's a fact. The problem is what if tomorrow comes and you're not prepared? That's where the problem arises, right? Because you have to look at yourself and say, well, my average life expectancy rate as a black man is this, as a white man is this, as a, you know, or whatever ethnic female, male race that you are. That's my average life expectancy. Sudden death can happen. But you know, hey, 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 Roger, I, well, let me just one more, right? Okay. Okay. And that one thought is I tell people all the time, you only know that you're alive. When you're dead, you have no idea. And no one has come back and told me what death is like. So therefore, I have to prepare for the living while knowing that at, at any moment I can die. Yeah, John, go ahead. And um, what I was going to say, you know, I, I give an example of my father. And it, it, I think sometimes it's it might be West Indian or or Caribbean individuals. My dad didn't think like that. Um, He didn't believe in having a life insurance policy, but my mother had a life insurance policy for him. But what thing that my father did, I remember my father said, you know, I don't believe in life insurance policies. And when I die, you know, you guys can bury me. However, standing up. Uh, he said, "Y'all guys can bury me," but he says, "I have, pro- I is, I have property. Mm-hmm. I have property. I have homes. I have equity. You do what you need to do." But at the same time, he had money in the bank, so God forbid anything happened to him, we can bury him, or his kids were in a position that we could take care of it. But what was interesting about my father, although he didn't have a life insurance policy, what he did was he purchased a mausoleum. And he paid for his mausoleum. So in, in, in one step, he didn't believe in life insurance policy, but in actuality, he did because he paid for his mausoleum. Because one of the most expensive things about a, about when you pass away 
is actually when you get buried in that ground. Yes, it is. Besides, you know, the caskets could be a couple of uh, a, a, a thousand or two thousand dollars, but that plot will run you anywhere between five to ten thousand dollars, if not more. More. If not more. More. Um, Joanne, I think Chris had a question. You want to bring that up for yeah. um, the question is what would you pay off first? Students or parent plus loan? Oh, student slash parent plus loan or mortgage? That's a good question. I was looking at it and I was thinking about it this whole time as I saw it on the screen. And my answer would be it really depends on the balance, it depends on the interest rate, and it depends on where you are financially. Right. So normally what we tell our families is, you, of course, you want to go for the thing that has a lower interest rate. Right. So many people think I'm going to pay off the thing that has the biggest balance first, which probably would. Well, it depends on what kind of school you went to. Right. You have um, really large student loans. But most of the time it's the mortgage. <laughs> but you want to focus on what has the lowest interest rate first, because that is what's going to eat your money up. Now, mortgages. Why? is not why why not the high interest because i always tell people pay off the high interest because you pay more per month so you wanna you are right the highest interest rate you want to kill first right instead of the low okay gotcha yeah you were right but i think what you were trying to say is the lowest balance to get no 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 I, I, I okay. yeah and okay. i actually was telling somebody about this before that there's something called the rule of seven have either of you heard it before the rule of what 72 of yes course. yeah i didn't explain i'm licensed so that's why i know what do you have your license then like marijuana not at all <laughs> so, so explain to, audience, to me explain to audience what's the rule of 72 the rule of 72 is the compounding effective interest. It was created by none other than Einstein. <laughs> but it tells you the compounding effective interest. So what it is, and I'm going to slow it down just so that if there's anybody out there taking notes or just really want to know what it is. Um, but it, if you take the number 72 and you divide it by the interest rate that you have on an account, what it will give you is how many years it'll take for your money to double. Right. So the same way we can use it to see how our money doubles, we can also use it reverse. Right. We can use it with debt. So let's say, for example, you have a, let's say your student loan has an interest rate of like 20 percent. That's really high. But let's just see. And let me pull up my calculator. So what you would do is you would take the number 72 and you divide it by 20 and you get 3.6. So every 3.6 years, your balance on that student loan is doubling. So you ever realize how interest rates on like investment accounts are really low, but on our credit accounts, they're really, really high. That's why is because the higher it is, right, the quicker it'll double. So it's in favor to have higher interest rates on things like our debt <laughs> as opposed to our investment. Excellent. So basically you're saying to someone, um, pay off, pay off the high interest rate because it's going to cost you more money in the long run, no matter how much it is. Yes. Get it on the first and then move on to the next. And then you can actually double up or whatever, use the money that you, but I always tell people when I give them financial advice, if they ask the question is whatever money that you're using on this card, once the card is paid up, put all of that money on the next card and don't think that you have free money, but utilize that money to get rid of the rest of the, your debt. Right. Yeah. So basically, what you're saying is the lower the interest rate is, the longer it will take for it to double. Yes. But the higher interest rate that you have, it will it, it will take a shorter period of time for it to double. Yes. Yeah, and, and I want to add one thing to that, John. And, and to me, I thank you for bringing that up. Right. Because people often say that's why I always tell people I don't believe in passbook savings. Because like you just do, let's say you go to a bank. Now, let's use that same rule of 72, and you can pull out your calculator for that. The average bank gives you like 0.4% interest rate. So what's 72 divided, um, divided by 0.4, if you have your calculator in front of you? So let people understand why it's not good to put money in savings account as your primary source of, source of investment. 1,800. <laughs> 1,800 years. It takes for you to double your, um, that means you'll be dead by the time your money's doubled. Yes. Now, 
take the same amount and say you're in an investment account of 13.9 percent which is the which is an average return on a full investment on the stocks what's what would that number be 5.1 again say that number again so if you invest the same amount of money in the stock market on average in 5.1 years your money will double and how much is it that you put in the savings account again you're asking me yeah, that's the move. You told me what was the number. So I want the audience to really understand when we talk about financial literacy, why is this conversation so important? That when you, oh, I don't want to invest in the stock market. I don't want to have a home, right? I don't want to do this. You pay off a home, right? You you have that money. That's why you want to pay off your mortgage early. Make an extra payment per year because if you make an extra payment, it lessens your mortgage by about 15, 11 to 15 years, depends on how much you're paying off which means that at that point, your house is only growing interest, right? Um, I don't know if you had said it because I was moving around the studio. I want to go back to something that John said earlier about budgeting. What should go into your budget? I don't know if you it was brought up. If it wasn't, please answer it now. If you were, please repeat it. No, we don't. Yeah, we don't. Yeah, about it. About well, everything. <laughs> I say absolutely everything should go into your budget and you should have a little, pl a little bit of play money at the end. So when I do financial reviews with families or my own, right, because I look at my finances every week as well to just make sure that I stay on track, I want to make sure that I'm calculating bills, money for food, money for gas, money for any unexpected thing that may come up so that when I take money and I go put it in my table, go ahead and invest that, that it stays there. I'm prepared for absolutely everything that may come throughout my week, except for actual emergencies, right? That's why you have an emergency fund. But everything else I calculate to make sure that I'm not pulling money from where it should be, which are my savings and investments. So to answer your question, absolutely everything goes into your budget. And I think what you said, Ms. Terry, I, I think that is so important what you just said. Everything goes in your budget. And you need to do a budget because you can see how you're spending your money. And it gives you an overall picture of where you can save a few pennies here, a few dollars here, and use that money to to invest, say, into your 401k or divest in, or invest into your deferred comp. So I think what you said was, and you said talk about it, look at it every week. You know, what's important is, you know, like on a weekend or something, just look and see, you know, how am I spending my money? You know, how can I budget myself? What can I put aside for a rainy day? Because there's always a rainy day. Always. There's always something that happens that will, uh, you know, I remember uh, a, a sewer pipe busted in front of my house. So uh, a sewer pipe that job costs about $20,000 to do, you know, and you have to be prepared. You know, everybody's not wealthy like Roderick and, and the doc, you know, so uh, we have to work hard for our money and, and invest it wisely. You, you, you know, I'm going to ignore John's comment on that one, but, yeah, um, please, please. <laughs> um, but you know, what's, what's interesting though, to me, uh, uh, I remember many years ago when I was doing my budget, I had a line item, literal line item. And I think I brought this up before. And a lot of my girlfriends at the time thought, that sounds bad, right? A lot of my girlfriends. That sounds terrible. As you would say, Roger, kumbaya. <laughs> right? So, but they all thought I was cheap. And I was like, no, I wasn't. I spent money. But what I did was I started analyzing how I was spending money. Right. So I would put down uh, if I bought a, 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 a Wrigley's gum for 25 cents it was in my ledger. I want to know exactly where my money was going. And that's how I found out how I was wasting money, literally how I was wasting money. Right. And what was the number one waste of money? I didn't cook. Number one waste of money, because every day I was buying either breakfast lunch or dinner or all three i'm guilty of that my friend 
Yeah. Right? You understand what I'm saying? And then a couple of years ago, I met a man. His name is, uh, he's a financial person. And his name is um, Kester, Kester Hector, right? He has also been a guest on the show. And he brought up something important. If you, over a lifetime, if you took away the money you spent for coffee, the $2 a day, $10 a week, over 30 years of invest that money, you could have over $200,000 just in your financial portfolio. If you put that into your IRA, not into the bank, not into a savings account, but into an investment account, that same $10 every day, that $120 a month or whatever the number comes out to be for whatever that number is, $80 a month, right? That, that could net you about $200,000 if you do the investment properly. Right, so that, and it's it's very important. What's that question on the screen? What do you think about the fact there about, there are over 50 million, million 50, 50 million years mm -hmm. and who aren't so rich pay a great deal of taxes, who aren't so rich. I'm not sure I understand the question. What do you think about the fact that there are over 50 million years and people who aren't so rich pay a great, I, I, I'm not sure what the question is saying. Um, Basically what it's saying is there's so many millionaires who pay less taxes than people who aren't in that situation. You know, and, and it's because of the loopholes that the tax loopholes that exist that are on the books, they take advantage of. And there's nothing wrong with it. If it's on the books, you're going to take advantage of it. Um, I wanted to I to answer that question, but I also wanted to respond to the points that you made a few seconds ago, Roderick, about just like a way how you had absolutely. That's super right. <laughs> because so many people sometimes you sit down with them and they have no clue where their money is going. You do their financial budget and they're supposed to be positive $500, $1,000 at the end of the month. And guess what? They have absolutely no clue where it's going. So it's good to keep track of the things that you're spending on so you can be aware of where it is that your money is going. Because sometimes it it just goes like, like that. <laughs> it's so easy to swipe your card and just happen to spend $100, $200, $300, right? So I think that's pretty cool that you did that. And it's a really good habit because after some time, it's not going to be as hard as you think. It's going to be, let me sit down for five minutes, let me knock it out, and boom, I'm done, right? The first time may take some time. It may be a little bit annoying, but you'll get used to it. And to answer the question that was on the screen, I believe he was just saying, um, what, do, what do we think about the people that actually have a lot of money and don't have to pay a lot on taxes so like different tax breaks and my answer to that is always education we want to just continue like forget the rich people right they're going to keep doing their thing they're going to keep elevating themselves in whatever way they're going to elevate themselves we have a responsibility to our community to help them get to that millionaire position right and one hidden fact that i feel like a lot of people aren't aware about are tax not tax never investments right so joanne probably knows a little bit about what i'm talking about when i say tax now invest tax never investments but you want to make sure that you at least have some sort of money in every single area right so you want to diversify your portfolio and make sure that you're taking advantage of some tax never investments that's how we can begin to equalize our opportunities the same way that the wealthy do it we can stop like being so sad about what it is that they have what they don't have or well what they have right because they have everything right and we just have to level the playing field make sure that we're upping our competence our knowledge our confidence in our financial situation and utilizing the tools that are out there for us the only part that sucks is that it's not like information that's widespread so that's why people like me <laughs> have a responsibility joanne roger john i'm sure you guys all feel the same way too to go out and educate and make sure that we're sharing the same things that the wealthy are using to go ahead to get to our friends and family and our community because it's not being taught in school it's not we're being taught to become consumers but not leaders in regards to our financial wealth spot on all right um, I just want to make sure that I add one concept uh, to, I, I want to go back also to what uh, Deidre um, Gilt's RN was saying, right? I want to make sure I add that. If you do a ledger, you will find out how many pleasures you have. 
right? And that affect how you are budgeting. If you got to look at, sometimes people think like this is enough, but again, when you retire, you expect to live 20 years after retirement. And you want, and Joanne touched on this earlier, you want to have, either Joanne or John, I don't remember which one, you want to have the same lifestyle that you had, right? So without any change, if not better, if not better. Right. So the other thing that I want to talk about, um, and maybe you, you talk about this too uh, uh, again, um, Tamia, um, is people who use their children as their retirement fund. And you see a lot of that in poor communities. You need to take care of me because I took care of you. Right. So now it's your job to return the favor of taking care of me. And that's part of that reason, again, that they don't believe in life insurance. They don't believe in, not, and again, when I, when I say don't believe, I mean, they don't do anything about it. So it's not just a matter of, um, it's not a matter of them not believing, but they're not really doing something about it. So they might believe in it, but don't do anything. And, and, and lastly, I want to make sure when I talk about the budget, I want to talk about the positive aspects of the budget too, right? that people actually need to say, go through the hard time and budget this much percentage of your money on your salary. Because you, remember, you will have to have your savings account for emergency, like your $20,000 store, right? And then your investment money, which is gonna be your lifelong, your lifelong expense. So a couple of things that I touched on there um, that we can discuss. Yeah, so it's, it's interesting that you brought up just like retirement and things of that sort. I had two statistics that I wanted to share about that. And one of those is that 64% of Americans are not prepared for retirement. <laughs> right? How many? What percentage? 64 are not prepared for retirement. And on top of that, right? So the people who are prepared, the average 401k balance in 2019 was $65,000. In 2020, $91,000. The average balance for people retiring. I don't know about you guys, but I can't live off of $100,000 in retirement, right? And that's for what- For the rest of your life. For the, re exactly. <laughs> so I don't know how many people actually feel comfortable. Well, I'm sure so many people think that it's something that they deserve, right? Because they took care of their kids, but it's them becoming a burden <laughs> on their children. Right. Like their children's income is not meant to go ahead and prepare somebody else for retirement. I mean, of course, different circumstances. Right. For, but for the most part, we should be doing what we need to do to make sure that we can retire well and not retire with only one hundred thousand dollars in our account. So that was just the two statistics that I wanted to share. But I definitely think it's selfish <laughs> of some people to not think about their retirement. And it's different if you don't think about it because you don't know. And it's different if you think about it and you use your kids as an excuse or a free pass. Um, excellent. You know, the other thing that people tend to, and why this conversation is so important, people believe that Social Security, you can live off Social Security. What, what, is, what is your, as a financial advisor, what do, you, what do you talk about that? Oh, I see she bending over, John. <laughs> I don't, I, it's like something she wanted to talk about. All right, I'm listening. This ah. <laughs> Hour of Zero. I'm not too sure if any of you have like ever heard of it, ever read it by David McKnight, but definitely get it. I'm not too sure if I can find the page so quick. But in this book, it talks about just our financial stability as a here we go. As a country, right? And it talks about the four things that the country spends a lot of their money on, right? So Social Security, Medicaid, Medicare, and debt. That is where 92% of the American dollar goes. And then on Social the- Social Security, Medicaid. Social Security, Medicaid, Medicare, and national debt. And then on the following page, I wanna see if you guys can see it, but everywhere you see like that red, those are all of the things that the remaining cents have to go towards, right? So if 92 cents, are going to those four things. The remaining eight cents has to go to things like child nutrition, drug enforcement, pensions, income assistance, everything. 
all of those things. So if somebody tells me they want to depend on the government for their retirement, then I'm going to whip out this page. I might send them the book for free, <laughs> but go read it because that's not a safe place to just put all your eggs in one basket. Where we're heading as a country financially is not pretty. <laughs> and especially with the pandemic and all of the debt that we put ourselves into, it's not free money, <laughs> right? So we're almost damaging our economy for our future. So when people say, oh yeah, I have social security, I have my pension, oh yeah, how comfortable are you putting all of your money there? How comfortable are you saying that you can live your entire retirement off of the government? You trust the government that much? Yeah, <laughs> right? So I, that's my response is educate <laughs> on where our economy is as a whole, as a country from this book. <laughs> and then make some informed decisions because you want to, again, diversify your portfolio. You don't want to depend on Social Security. So I have a question for you. What is your vision and your last thoughts? Yes. So my vision, that's pretty big. <laughs> but my vision is, like I said, to have a massive impact. Mm -hmm. What I'm really truly focused on is team advocacy within our country. So I want to make sure that that is my main focus that I'm using the financial industry as a tool to help push me towards where I really want to be. And at the same time, I want to open up multiple offices within the financial industry because this is something that we cannot live without. Finances may not be everything, but it definitely gives you opportunities, freedom of your time, right? It allows you to buy back the time with your family. So to wrap it all up, my vision specifically, I want two offices of my financial industry life in every single state. I want my nonprofit organizations for teen advocacy to be all across the country. And I want to make sure that we expand both of those things outside of the country into different continents, into different countries to make sure that we're not only making an impact in the U.S., but we're changing the world. Thank you. Um, that's, that's my final thought. <laughs> I, I, we didn't get to touch on it, but I think we have about 30 seconds. I don't know if you can do it. Why is it important for people to like own businesses? Passive income. You can rely on yourself, <laughs> right? At the end of the day, you don't have to trust the boss to sign off on your paycheck. You sign off on your own paycheck. And that's, I, you know, I tell people, that's what people get when they, when you saw like these millionaires, who have these major write-offs is because they own their own business. And they can write a lot of things off that you, the average person, the middle class, cannot write off. Right? Um, John, you have any final questions? I know you stepped off for a minute. Do you have any final questions first? She has to go. She has another appointment, so. Okay. My, my, my final question is to um, we want you back on this show because I think what you our espousing is so important, uh, financial literacy, and just uh, so we can, people can be, start preparing for, 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 for the future. And you said something that's profound, relying on the government, 92%, 92% is concentrated on four areas, and there's only 8% left. And you just think about that, that's so profound. So you and can't rely on the government. Yeah, go ahead. You can't rely on the government for anything. So it's all about the best person to rely on is yourself. Absolutely. Again, the rich takes care of them, take care, take care of themselves, and the middle class take care of everybody. Exactly. Right. So I thank Miss Terry. I thank you very much for the knowledge that you imparted with us today. Of course, thank you so much for having me. And I look forward to tuning in more in the future, chatting it up more with you all and changing the world together. Where can people reach you? Um, you can, I don't know if they can see like my Facebook profile through here, but definitely Facebook. And if you Google my name. What my is your Facebook? Go ahead. It's just Tamia Terry. Okay. And if you Google my name and revolutionfinancialmanagement.com, my website will show up. I have my email there. My phone number is on there. Um, just Google revolutionfinancialmanagement.com to me, Terry. Awesome. Thank you for joining us on the Thank you so much. All right.